Were you surprised that America allowed this radical group, Black Lives Matter, to carry out an insurrection upon America, burn down buildings, kill people, rob and rape and steal and 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 just be violent and nasty and evil and get away with it. Were you surprised that America allowed that to happen? Well, I can't really speak to that because I don't know for sure if those acts happened. And like I said, I wasn't following it to that level where I would see that and be able to confirm. Oh, you didn't see it burning in the instruction on the news reports? Mm, I don't know what you're speaking of, so I don't think I can speak to that comfortably. Oh, okay. Welcome to The Fallen State. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. The Fallen State is now on Patreon. So click on the Patreon link in the description to support our work. I absolutely appreciate it. I have with me today, Dr. Judy Ho. She is a triple board certified clinical and forensic neuropsychologist. She's also a tenured associate professor of psychology at Pepperdine University. Dr. Ho, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Jesse. It's a pleasure. Yeah, same here. I absolutely appreciate it. Um, I watched some of your videos, and it's absolutely amazing. So I want to get into as much as I can. Um, I wanted to ask, what made you decide to go into uh, forensic neuropsychologist? Well, I first became interested in the field of psychology in high school, and I actually was part of the Big Sister Big Brother program. I was volunteering as a mentor. And I met my first mentee who was just 10 years old and she had been in and out of foster homes like 10 or 12 by the time I'd met her. And even though I was just a kid too and I didn't really know what I was doing, I just realized that even just by consistently showing up every week at the same time to take her to ice cream or just to hang out with her or go to a movie, that it was a positive influence on her so that she could have somebody that she could rely on and talk to. And that was really my first interest in psychology. I realized that one person can make a big difference yeah. and that with more training and expertise, I could help even more. Amazing. I wanted to talk to you about anxiety and depression and stress and all of that. A lot of people are stressed out nowadays due, due to the lockdown. What is the primary cause of uh, depression, anxiety, and stress? It's a really good question, Jesse. And a recent survey showed that about 35% of Americans were experiencing clinically significant depression and anxiety in this past year. And I think some of the key factors for why that has been on the uptick is because the pandemic has really caused people to feel like a loss of control. And all of us human beings, we'd love to feel like we were more in control of our environment, of our life. And we just didn't have that control. We couldn't predict the future. That's very, very hard for us to deal with in a long-term way. Also, people were grieving these past ways of life, how we used to interact with one another. Some people were actually grieving because they lost loved ones due to the pandemic or they lost their jobs or they were grieving just the way that they socialize with people. So there was a lot of grief that was also in the mix as well. And when that prolongs for long periods of time and you can't see the end of it, I think that's what caused so many people to become stressed and clinically depressed and anxious. Is it normal for people to uh, become depressed or stressed and anxiety? Is that normal uh, state of being or abnormal? You know, it's so hard to say when you talk about definitions of normality now, because when we think about the fact that a third of people were feeling that way, then it feels almost like not abnormal anymore. <laughs> it wasn't really kind of statistically uh, different. So I think that, you know, part of the stigma that we deal with with mental health is that people feel like there's something wrong with them. Whether we want to talk about normality or, or non-normality, I think, unfortunately, it's just something that we have to deal with. Everybody's lives has been touched by some point with depression or anxiety or stress, whether it's yourself or somebody you care about. And so I just think that we just need to have those conversations in a more open and honest way and help people to get the support that they need. Is it possible to permanently overcome these things? Yes, I think that it's really possible to learn coping strategies to manage them. And I think a lot of people, when they come to me in therapy, they say, well, after treatment, does this mean I'll never be depressed again? And for some people, that's true that their depression doesn't come back. But for a lot of people, it does. 
But what I tell them is, but now you have the tools. So the next time you notice these symptoms, you don't have to let them get as severe as they did this time. You just apply those techniques, you cope with it and you move on. So I think that that's really an important message for people to understand. Sometimes people feel like they're a failure if their depression comes right. back up later in life. And it's not. What, uh, what, what are some of the ways or techniques of overcoming these things? Well, I am a cognitive behavioral therapist. And what that means is my theory about mental distress is that everything is really triggered by thought processes. And then your thoughts affect your feelings yeah. and then they affect your actions. So sometimes we don't pay attention to our thoughts. You know, we kind of go around, most people have more than 30 or 40,000 thought fragments in a day. Clearly we're not paying attention to all of them, but some of these thoughts are really damaging. They might be very self-disparaging thoughts, hopeless thoughts. And if you allow your emotions to run with that, then you will become depressed and anxious over time. So it's important to notice your thinking and to really assess your thinking. Thoughts are just mental events. They don't absolutely reflect the truth, even if we feel that way. And so becoming more conscious of your thought process and then applying techniques to really suss out your thoughts, modify your thoughts when they are inaccurate or maybe just way out there, way too hopeless, way too catastrophic. And then really exposing yourself to opportunities for positive emotions. That's a really important piece of this. You know, When people become depressed or anxious, they tend to isolate. So with that isolation, they remove any opportunities they have to, to feel better, to meet people, to have experiences that could bring their mood up. And so a big part of cognitive behavioral therapy is also teaching people the importance of exposing yourself to positive circumstances yeah. and allowing yourself the opportunity to feel happy emotions. I, I've noticed that all thoughts are lies. They, t they tend to build you up to have you feeling good. As soon as you're feeling good, they bring you down. Now you're feeling bad. Then you, they build you up and bring you down and build you up. And now you want to jump off a bridge. Do you agree that all thoughts are lies? No such thing as a true thought. Thoughts are just perception. So I agree with your perspective on that. Really, they're not absolute truths. You know, they're your interpretation of what's happening to you in the world. And you're so right about what you just said. Sometimes people build themselves up. They use too much of this idea of positive thinking. Yeah. And then sometimes they get disappointed and all of a sudden it goes into the pits. And so we really have to become more realistic with how we manage our thoughts instead of just saying, oh, I'm just going to think positive all the time, thinking that that's an uh, all cure. It's really not. I've noticed that um, anxiety, depression, and all those types of things are more of a female thing. But lately males have been getting that. It's kind of abnormal for a man to become depressed. What causing so many male to take on the female identity? Well, I think with depression and anxiety, historically we have seen higher rates of depression in females. And some of that is related to also reporting bias because we only know who is suffering when they tell it to us. And so sometimes I think males are not talking about their emotions in the same way and they don't experience depression in the same way. So for example, a lot of my male patients they don't talk about feeling sad. They talk about lack of energy, lack of sexual drive, no motivation, um, no interest in things that they used to like to do. And those are symptoms of depression, but there may be lesser known symptoms of depression. Whereas females will come and they're more often talking about things like I have a sad mood, I have a down mood and talk more about their mood and affective experiences. And I think that there is still such a stigma against men experiencing any kind of mental health symptoms. I think that, as you were mentioning, like maybe some of them may feel that it's demasculating or maybe sometimes they just feel like, well, if I was stronger, I wouldn't have these experiences. And so I don't think that it's part of the common conversation, even when they are suffering. So male mental health is actually a big area. I think that needs more support. We need to understand it more. And then when people are suffering, how do we get them help if they have a lot of self stigma about right. their experiences? Are you surprised when males come to you for help because in a normal state of being, men don't go to women for help like that because of the order of men being over women. Are you surprised so many men are looking to you for help? You know, I think that there's definitely a couple of different groups of people. And certainly when males come to me for help, I think they're looking kind of for that feminine factor in their life, perhaps Sometimes they haven't felt accepted by other females in their life. <laughs> but, I, but I also think that sometimes they come to me, 
you know? But sometimes I think they come to me because um, they're embarrassed to talk to another man about it. Um, similar, again, as I mentioned to you about the fact that there is a lot of stigma against mental health problems uh, in men. So they don't want to go talk to another man and admit to them, listen, I'm having these experiences. So then they feel kind of safer going to a, a female. They might think that they're less judged talking to a female about those problems. I want to talk to you about the attacks upon the Asians now. It seems to be around the country, out of control. What do you think the, ri the uh, rise in attack on Asians uh, in America is about? Why, why are we just now hearing about it? Why is it happening now? Yeah, this is a very good question, Jesse, and obviously one that hits very close to home because I identify as an Asian female and Chinese. And of course, you know, when we look across history, um, there has been a lot of discrimination um, and hate crimes against Asians. But right now, the, the uptick is largely due to the stress of the pandemic and some of the information that came out early during the discovery of COVID-19, the fact that it originated in China, you know, these things are very perplexing to people. And adding to that, people in the pandemic, they have been suffering, as we just talked about, with additional stress. They're all pent up for a long time. Everybody was on lockdown and they were looking for a way to express their frustration. And Asians are still, even to this day, even though obviously there's a larger population of Asians in America, they're still seen as a foreign race. They're just foreign. They look foreign, they seem foreign. <laughs> You know, and it's easy for people to essentially attack somebody that looks like they're outside of their own group. All you know, right. it's kind of a defense mechanism. Um, but of course, it's concerning. I'm, I'm glad that we're talking about it more. But, you know, the the instances of hate crimes against Asians has uh, occurred a lot, I think, because people think that it's some kind of retribution for the pandemic. I think that that's a big piece of it. And they're looking for someone to blame because it feels more comfortable to blame someone. And obviously, outside of the Asian race being attacked, People are attacking politicians or, you know, the leaders in their community. Like yeah. they just want somebody to like unleash their anger at. And I kind of understand that to an extent, you know, I mean, it's just because we're all so frustrated and don't know what to do. What a mess. Are you concerned when you are out and about, are you concerned about being attacked? I got to tell you, Jesse, I have been, um, and I'm concerned for my parents who are elderly and, uh, you know, they kind of walk around a little bit like, um, in a fairy tale, almost like nothing's going to happen to us. I'm like, well, you should probably just be a little bit on guard. Um, I haven't really felt that way in the past, but you know, in these last months, I have felt more worried to go out on my own, for example, at yeah. night to run an errand. And I never felt that way before. So that was an interesting, you know, it's an interesting experience. And I've talked to some of my friends and colleagues who are from the Asian Pacific Islander community, and they've experienced the same thing. They've experienced people yelling at them in the market, <laughs> you know, just really random things happening that they never had to deal with before. Have you noticed who is uh, mostly responsible for these attacks? I really think that it's all across the board. I mean, I haven't looked at the statistics, but I think, again, it's anybody who's not Asian or Pacific Islander, but because they see Asians, they see us as foreigners. And I think that that's a, that's a big piece of this. You know, it's like th these people look different. And you know what's really t tough as well? I mean, obviously, when we talk about the where we were first discovered COVID-19, it was Wuhan, it was in China. But my friends who are Filipino or Hawaiian, I mean, they're being yelled at and screamed at. And <laughs> yeah. it's like, well, it didn't even come from your country, but yet it's like everybody's being lumped together because of the way we look, you know? I notice in the media, um, they tend to blame it on white people that mm. is white supremacists, right? But when you're mm. looking at the story at the time that they're presenting the story, it's black people who are attacking Asians, but they won't say black people are doing it. They will find one story of a white person who 50 years ago maybe attacked one Asian or a few Asians, mm. and they'll use that. Why don't they call it for what it is? We all know that it's done by mostly by black people. Why don't they say it's black people who are doing it? That's a really interesting question, and I think that that speaks to more of all of the issues that I think we're having right now, Jesse, in the media, like people don't trust the media to give us the information straight anymore. 
I think that there is a lot of politically motivated yeah. media coverage. Yeah. And you don't really know if you're ever going to get accurate information. <laughs> right. And they seem to highlight certain groups. And it's just not fair. It's like, you know, if, if it happened, if, if it happened that, that a black person was the attacker, let's talk about that. If it was a white person, let's talk about that. If it's Latino, let's talk about that. But, you, but you're right. I think that everything has become politically motivated. And you know what that causes, Jesse, is a distrust in the media. Because yes. then people don't really know what we're supposed to do. We don't know what information we're getting. Then people have to go on their own and try to find this information. Now, some people are very successful. They're resourceful and educated and intelligent like you, Jesse. They know how to filter it out. But I've also seen people, because they're so lost, like they go to down these crazy trains of information that obviously are even more inaccurate. And that's that's kind of dangerous as well, right? Because then you start to harbor all of these different kinds of misconceptions. Uh, but even the Asians won't say that we are being attacked by blacks. And it's not uncommon. This has been going on for years against the Asian mm. people by the black folks in the uh, Asian move into the uh, black communities when they first come to this country or whatever. They set up mm -hmm. shop. And most of their troubles come from black people robbing the stores, beating them up, uh, mm -hmm. calling them names. And so it's commonplace. Black people know that it's black. The Asians know that it's black. But yet the Asian won't say that we are being attacked by black people, not by whites. What is holding them back from saying it so that we can do something about it? What are they afraid of? You know, I obviously can't speak for why people won't talk about it that way if they are truly the victims of these crimes that were perpetrated by black individuals. But I do wonder if people are worried about just perception, you know, talking about another minority group that has suffered oppression and discrimination and trying to highlight them as people who were potentially essentially the perpetrators in this case. I'm not really sure why that happened because again, I haven't talked to anybody who this has actually happened to. And then they basically misconstrued that fact or try to obscure the fact of who their attacker was. But I do wonder in this current political climate when everybody's trying to be so careful about what they say, if they're just not wanting to point that out because then it maybe feels like they're being anti, they're being racist themselves. You know, <laughs> I, I wonder if that's one of the issues. Yeah. Because I'm look, when I look at, you know, I lived in the black community for a while and I know that the Asians have been on attack by the blacks for a long time. It's not new. It's just being reported a little bit more, even though they're not saying blacks. And mm -hmm. I don't know how they're going to solve the problem if they don't call out who is doing this because what they're mm. doing is giving blacks permission to do it even more so by not pointing it out. Is it easier to falsely accuse whites than it is to tell the truth about what the blacks are doing? You know, I think that given everything that has happened, especially in these past months, with the highlighting of movements like Black Lives Matter, you know, and, and really pointing out obviously the social ills that do occur on that front, I think that people are having a tougher time really managing what it really means to be culturally inclusive. You know, I've had some of these conversations with my colleagues yeah. and I've talked to a, a couple of my white colleagues and, you know, they are trying, I, I would say that my white colleagues, ones I've talked to, they're trying their best, right. In these conversations, but they have told me, I know it sounds I, I don't, I don't, I don't even feel like I can say this because it sounds bad. It sounds racist. But like when I'm having these conversations with minority groups, sometimes I feel like I can't talk because if I say anything, then it means that I'm not giving them a voice or maybe I'm misinterpreting something, but I still want to be involved. So I think that there's some really well-intentioned white Americans <laughs> yeah. who are trying to do their best and they feel like they don't have a voice at this moment during this discussion because they feel like anything they say could be seen as an attack. But I want everybody to try to be honest, right? I mean, yeah. that's how we're going to move forward. That's right. But 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 I can kind of understand what they were saying when they were telling this to me. But even when they were saying it, they were like so afraid to tell me, right? Because <laughs> they were kind of afraid maybe of my reaction. Like what my like would I judge them? And yeah. I said, no, like that's how you feel. Like let's talk about it, you know? But so. by not being honest about it, it causes the blacks to attack them even more so because when you show fear to the bully, the bully only get worse. And so there are more and more attacks are happening to the, to, the, to the Asians and whites because the black people see that they are afraid of them. So you're just bringing out the worst in them. Isn't it better to tell the truth about it so something can be done about it and this stuff will end? 
You know, I think that whatever the truth is, because like I said, I haven't seen those statistics that you're talking about right now, Jesse, but I think whoever is the perpetrator, whoever, you know, whoever is the problem, we all need to be just more honest and report things the way they are so that we can deal with it. And maybe not everything has to be about necessarily the race of the person, right? It's just about the person. It's like, let's deal with the problem. Yeah. But I know that that's really hard right now in this political climate. I feel like everybody feels like they have to be so careful or else the things that they say can be misconstrued or they can be called racist and nobody wants to be called racist. You know, most people are well-intentioned in this world, right. you know, not everyone, but most. Yep. And I think that it's causing some people just to not even want to approach the conversation. Like they don't want to get their hands dirty and you can understand why they're so scared, right? Yeah, I do. But why I noticed that even the black so-called professionals and experts, even they won't admit that it's the black people. They are falsely accused whites as well. Why do you think that black experts, the police chiefs and other people won't admit, mm. well, we all know it's the black people who are doing it, so we got to deal with that. Why don't, the, why, why don't the blacks be honest about it? Why are they pretending that it's the whites? Mm. Again, I don't know because I haven't seen that in my black colleagues and I haven't seen them do that. So I can't speak for them. Oh, okay. I have no idea why that happens. Amazing. Yeah. Isn't that amazing, though? We're looking I mean, at it for what it is. They're showing Asians are attacked today, so they show the attacker. Mm -hmm. And you can see as a black person or black people, mm -hmm. but they're calling mm -hmm. it white supremacists. I'm like, but I'm looking mm -hmm. at black people. Uh, I, right. I don't see the whites, right? But they're calling mm -hmm. it other than what it really is. And we're looking right at it. And so now they think everybody's dumb because no one loves one another enough to stand up and tell the truth. Yeah, it's so important for us to be transparent more than ever. Yes. I mean, not even just for race issues, but right, even the pandemic, the public health issues. I mean, the, yep. the media has not been very good about being transparent. And that's why nobody trusts the media anymore. That's right. You know, that's why when you're that's why when you're putting out certain mandates or you're saying this rule applies and that <laughs> doesn't, why are there so many people who are saying, no, I'm not listening to you anymore? Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. People are just confused and angry. It's like tell it to us straight. And then we feel like we're kind of getting stuff on the back end. Like three months later, we find out why they put this message out, right? It's just, I think that that's that's really a mess. You know, I, I miss the times, you know, and I feel like I remember this more when I was younger, where I think there was more inherent trust in yes. the media, that they would cover things more accurately. Absolutely. Now it feels right. Now it feels like media is just a bunch of people giving their opinions, <laughs> and like I don't know where the facts are and where it's somebody's opinion anymore. I know it makes it harder to watch the news. It, it does. sure does because you can't trust them, so you don't know what is right, yeah. what is wrong. There is a group called Stop Asian Hate, and yes. it's a campaign. And it sounds like Black Lives Matter group. And, um, and we all know that Black Lives Matter is an organization that was started by a bunch of fat, black, radical lesbians who uh, admit to being Marxists. Why would Stop Asian group want to compare themselves? How do they feel? How does it feel knowing that they have been compared to a, a group called Black Lives Matter who works in the KKK. How do they feel about that? You know, I don't know the reputation um, of how the Stop Asian Hate group is being compared to Black Lives Matter. And I also don't know about some of the specifics of, um, you know, the people who originated that movement and what they're up to now. But I know that, you know, for us, I mean, at least for me speaking for myself, Stop Asian Hate is a resource where they're pointing out and trying to collect statistics on how much this happens. Right. And it's really the only organization that I know that is collecting those types of statistics. So I think in that way, it makes them different from any other organization. I'm not really that well versed in either one. And I think that with Stop Asian Hate, one of the platforms and one of the reasons for wanting to get out their message is just pointing out, hey, like this is happening and it's increasing. And yeah. I think that it's just a problem that, you know, we have to look at, but at the same time, Jesse, it's not, we talked about this, right? It's not a, it's not a problem that just started now. It's not a problem that just started in the pandemic. It's been going there on for certainly a long has time. been Asian hate, like all throughout history. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Are you concerned that they, um, that, um, uh, does it concern you that Asian activists are sounding like Black Lives Matter? 
You know, I'm not familiar again with all of the different activists that are out there. The ones that I'm more familiar with, they're not really necessarily trying to compare themselves to Black Lives Matter. I think that they're trying to say, you know, this is sort of everybody's got their own experience. This is our experience. Most of the people that I'm uh, acquainted with um, who are doing acts of activism in this area are really trying to get people more educated and trained up. So they're promoting things like bystander training programs where it's like, if you see something happening, like, what do you do? Because a lot of people, they see it and they don't know what to do. I mean, sometimes they might film it, but nobody yeah. wants to intervene I because sometimes that. that might be right. It's like everybody wants to do viral justice, but <laughs> If somebody's being killed, maybe you should do something else other than film it on your phone. That's you know? right. So, so anyway, I think most of the activists I know are actually trying to promote those types of programs, and I think they're needed. Like we need bystander intervention training. We like, do. how do I help somebody else with also staying safe myself? Right. Like, if I'm walking down the street and I see somebody being attacked, and it's just me, and I'm just one woman, like. I think I would be scared to intervene if I didn't know the steps right. or like how to do it safely. Absolutely. Yeah. Were you surprised that America allowed? this radical group, Black Lives Matter, to carry out an insurrection upon America, burn down buildings, kill people, rob and rape and steal and, 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 and just be violent and nasty and evil and get away with it. Were you surprised that America allowed that to happen? Well, I can't really speak to that because I don't know for sure if those acts happened. And like I said, I wasn't following it to that level where I would see that and be able to come. Oh, you didn't see the burning and destruction on the news reports? Mm, I don't know what you're speaking of, so I don't think I can speak to that comfortably. Oh, OK. Um, yeah. So you didn't see any of the uh, insurrection that Black Lives Matter committed upon the country uh, during the summer and other parts when they were burning and stealing and robbing and killing all around the country? No, I don't think that I saw those being attributed specifically to Black Lives Matter. So, Do you support uh, defunding police? Well, I think that that's a personal question for a lot of people. You know, I think that's an important question for a lot of people. I have friends who are part of the police force. Right. And Me I think too. that the answer is not to defund them. The answer is to educate them better and provide them resources. So, you know, I think the vast majority of people try to do their best job. You have bad seeds and every part of the sector, no matter if it's police or any other job. And I think the most important thing is to understand that sometimes they're under-resourced, sometimes they don't have the education, and it's important to provide those resources where they're needed. My best friend works um, at, a police, uh, at a police jurisdiction, right. and she said that it was really hard for her to go to work every day and try to do her job of protecting the public yeah. and basically be yelled at and screamed at and told <laughs> that she wasn't doing her job, you know, and, and she's so innocent. She's like, she's not even a police officer. She works at a police. She's a <laughs> civilian. Yeah. She's a civilian working at a police, uh, police station, and she had a lot of, essentially a lot of um, anger being hurled at her for trying to do her job, and her husband is a lieutenant. And they really had a very, very rough summer with everything. And that, I think is, that, that is so, tough, you know? Yeah, it's so unfortunate. These people get up and they go out and they try to protect the, the, peop the good people from the bad. And now they're yeah. being accused. And it's hard now to recruit police officers because yeah. Uh, yeah. of the way they that they're being retreated. Well, yeah. And, and then the good people who are, I mean, again, right? Every sector has its bad seats, right. but the vast majority, vast majority are good people and they were trying to do their job and they were afraid for their own lives and their own mental health probably was affected because they also had to deal with the pandemic and everything else that came with it. And so I think, again, you know, so much of it is education and resources. I mean, I've talked to many police officers or former detectives and they're just like, we just don't have all the resources and sometimes we don't understand so if we had more of those things, it would help us to do our job better. And I also think that it might be helpful to screen police officers a little bit more often. I mean, they are in the line of duty so much and there's a lot of PTSD that happens among police officers. And so maybe some of them just need more support. Maybe they need a little time off and then they can come back fresh and be able to do a better job. Yeah. But it's really hard to ask people to make good decisions all the time when they're in a perpetual state of trauma. Yes. And that happens with our first line workers. I noticed though in America, the police is not the problem. It's the radical blacks who are the problem. They are running from the cops. They, are, they have weapons. They're trying to kill the cops. They are either drug addicts or, or they've been in prisons before. And so instead of pointing out, hey, the cop is not wrong in this situation, it's the, the black person that's wrong that, you know, been 
acting out and carrying on and disobeying the cop. They blame the cop rather than blaming the person that committed the crime. How do we get to that? Well, I mean, I don't know if that's a trend that happens all the time, you know? So I don't, again, I don't feel comfortable speaking to that because I'm not sure if that's a trend that's always the truth. I was surprised, you know, this guy, uh, George Floyd, right? The guy that was, mm -hmm. died in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. This guy was an unemployed drug addict. He had been in and out of prison. He had, uh, uh, he was accused of trying to use fake money to, in a store. And yet, they blamed the cop rather than George Floyd. And that's what started all this mess. I don't know what happened to America that the, uh, the troublemaker become the, uh, the innocent person become the, the villain and the person that caused the problem become the victim. How did, that, how did good become evil and evil become good? The cops are on the side of what's right doing their job. But the guy that's causing all the problems, the one that is lifted up as a hero, how did that happen in America? Well, again, I don't really feel comfortable com commenting on that issue. I got to ask you about relationships. You did a um, you did a segment with the uh, doctor's TV show on relationship. I thought it was very good, by the way. Oh, thank you. It was Mama Mia. It was hola. Uh, mm -hmm. The segments cover how women are now wearing the parents in their pants, parent, pants in their relationship. Mm -hmm. How did that switch from the women wearing the parents, pants and the men wearing the dresses? You know, I think that that was sort of like a tongue in cheek segment where we're talking about how this is sort of something that we see happening where maybe there's a gender role reversal yeah. or maybe the gender roles go back and forth in a relationship. And, you know, I mean, I know people who are in my social circle or in my colleagues where maybe that's the truth. And then there are some people who I know females who are killers at work. They like work really hard and they're very successful business women, but then they go home and they kind of enjoy the more traditional gender roles as well. So I don't think that it's necessarily something that's happening to every single person, but that segment was really kind of like a tongue in cheek segment of like, Hey, this seems like it's happening more like what's going on with that. And people kind of have their fun with it and joke around. Um, but I do think that there are some people and that's more of a personality thing where, you know, they like to be in more control. And so they get <laughs> in these relationships and either they find somebody who's equally controlling and maybe they will butt heads more, or they find somebody who's a little bit more passive, like, okay, whatever you want, it's fine. And they just kind of let it go, you know? And I, I mean, I'm not going to speak to like what works in different people's relationships. I think that you just need to know who you are and right. what you're looking for yeah. and don't lie about that up front, or else you're not going to be in a happy relationship. If you say, oh, I'm fine with a woman wearing the pants, but if you're out really not, then <laughs> half a year down the relationship, you guys are going to have a lot of fights. Yeah, that's for sure. Do things work better when men lead or when women lead? I think it depends on the situation. And I think it depends on the type of problem. You know, I think that's certain problems and certain problems uh, that can happen in a relationship or at work. You know, some people just have the strength to solve better. It may or may not have to do with their gender. But um, I think that whoever is better at solving the problem should lead. Dr. Ho, I've noticed that it's not in the nature of women to lead. It's in the nature of the man to lead. And whenever uh, women take over, things tend to fall apart, whether it's in the family or in the schools or in government or in jobs, businesses and whatever. It's not in the nature of a woman to lead. It's in the man's nature. Women don't have that in them. Why would we take a risk of trying to let a woman leave when we know it's not in her nature? Hmm, I don't know if I agree with that statement. So and, and, and why not? I, I don't think... I don't think I agree with it. I think that women and men have equal capacities to lead and everybody has a opportunity to be a leader if they're given the opportunity to develop it and if they have the skill sets to develop it. And so I don't agree that women don't have the capability to lead. So if, if why is it then that whenever women take over, you let them take over their homes or the military or anything, Everything falls apart. It's weakened. It's more emotional. It's, it's not logical. If women is, is given the ability by God to lead, why, does th why do things fall apart when they take over? 
Yeah, again, I don't agree with that statement. And so what, I don't do you think agree that, that's that You don't agree that things fall apart when women take over? No, I don't. Do they get better? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, I don't think it has to do with gender all the time. I think it just has to do with the person, the individual. And if they're right for the leadership role, then they can do it no matter what gender they are. There tend to be proper roles for men and proper roles for women. And, and whenever you uh, leave that role that you were created to do, that's when things tend to fall apart. Let's say that a man stay home and be a so-called house mom, right? Mother. And the woman go out to work. Things only get worse. They don't get better. It just doesn't, it's not in her nature. And what's wrong with women admitting that they are not created to lead? Again, I don't agree with that. I don't think that things fall apart when women lead or when women go to work. So I disagree with that. Are you able to, and I might be missing something. So since you're the professional, I want to know. Are you able to give me an example where women took over and things got better? I think, again, as I mentioned, it's not really about giving specific examples. I disagree with that on the foundation of it. I think that women can be really good employees and really good leaders. And so I think that that's a myth that is propagated about gender roles. What caused you to think that? Why do you think that without the proof? Well, I don't think it's about proof. I mean, it's about knowing good leaders in my world. It's knowing good leaders in my social circles. When I see the people who are employed in my communities, they're doing a great job. So I don't agree with that. Amazing. I want to talk about Stop Self-Sabotage. That's the name of your book, right? You wrote a yes. book called Stop Self-Sabotage, Six Steps to Unlock Your True Motivation. What is the primary cause of self-sabotage? Well, self-sabotage happens when you get in your own way. And it can be caused by all kinds of things. It can be caused by low self-esteem. It could be caused by maybe some of the feelings that you've had growing up, um, learning from your parents and other important adults in your lives about how the world works. It can be caused by people who are really afraid of change or the unknown. And it can also be caused by people who really have an excessive need to control everything in their environment. So there's a variety of different causes, but self-sabotage tends to be somewhat universal because all human beings have either said, I've self-sabotaged something or yeah. they know somebody who said that. Like it's a very common thing that people talk about. And that's why I decided to write a book about it. I noticed though it's abnormal because when I was growing up, uh, boys were boys and men were men. You didn't see as much of that as you see today. What brought on the change? That's a good question. You know, I don't know if there's generational things that are happening. You know, I know that I've talked to a lot of people who have thought that, you know, perhaps we're not allowing our children and our younger generation to make mistakes right. when they're still under our roof. Yeah allowing them to kind of grow up um, and, you know, realize that sometimes there are winners and sometimes there are losers. I mean, that's just how the world works. Yeah. Right. And uh, one of the things that I joke about a lot with some of my friends is like this idea of participation trophies, right? Like my, my friends who are parents, they're always telling me how much it drives them crazy uh, that there's participation trophies now. And it gives yeah. this false sense yeah. um, that someone's that everyone wins in uh, in a sports game. It's like, well, that's not how sports games work, you know? <laughs> um, and so I think that there might be something there, you know, we talk about the fact that we see an increase, Jesse, in what we call failure to launch over the last couple of decades. And that means we're talking about an adult male or adult female who might be in their 30s, 40s, or 50s. And it's like they never crossed that developmental barrier. Yes. They never like got independent, um, financially independent, uh, living on their own, like able to have adult relationships. And it's like, what is the cause of that? And I do wonder if maybe in parents' need to try to protect their children more they went a little overboard right and now their children are not as resilient as maybe they were you know in my parents generation or in my grandparents generation it's like whatever you just go to work it doesn't matter if you like it or not you just go because you have to put food on the table and now i think that um people feel like the smallest slight and their life is falling apart and i do wonder if we aren't are not doing our children a favor by overly protecting them absolutely I do um, uh, not only the Father's State show here, but I also do a radio show Monday through Friday. And I get calls every day from uh, men and women who have been set up for self-sabotage by their mothers, and then their fathers don't protect them from the mothers. But when they talk about it, I saw you talking to Dr. Field with a family about this. 
Mm-hmm. I noticed that the blame tend to go toward the father and not the mother, when in reality we all know that it's the mother who weakened the children, turned them away from their fathers, and set them up for a destructive life. Why don't they deal with the mothers and what they're doing to the children Why the fathers are not paying attention? Well, I don't agree with that statement. Again, I don't think that mothers are all unilaterally evil and are the causes of their children's downfall. So I don't think I can answer that question because I don't agree with your statement. So if they're not evil, what is not love that does? What is it that caused mothers to do that to the children? Well, again, it's not all mothers. Sometimes right. it's fathers and sometimes it's mothers. You know, I think it just depends. And in every single individual family, you know, whatever that family problem is, And, you know, I have friends who specialize in family therapy. And when they go into a family, they look at the unit and they say, okay, well, what is wrong with this family system? You know, there's always somebody who's being blamed for everything. We call that the scapegoat, right? Sometimes that's the mother, sometimes that's the father, sometimes it's one of the children. But what the scapegoat does is that then they don't have to deal with their own issues, right? Everybody is focused on the scapegoat. And that, that particular episode you were talking about with Dr. Phil, I felt like the scapegoat was a guy who everybody was supposedly saying is a patient. Right. Yeah. But then when you talk to everybody else in the family, yeah. you're like, listen, all of you guys have other stuff you need to deal with that you are not. And you're blaming your son for everything. But everybody's got to look at their behaviors. Right? I'm glad to see you point that out. That was very good, by the way, because as adults, we all have to take responsibility as children. As children, we do become like our parents. But as adults, mm-hmm. we have to overcome it. And you can always tell mm-hmm. when children have had bad parents because they mm-hmm. become like them. They become alcoholics and drug addicts and and liars and thieves because they were just like the parent, but the parent are pretending that they're innocent. And all of a sudden, the kids, that be, the kids became that way on their own, and it just doesn't work that way. Bad parents produce bad children. Yeah, I think it's really tough when people, when you talk about how children feel when they're exposed to bad parenting or trauma or abuse by their parents. Yeah. And obviously as kids, you have no control, right? That's you're right. a kid, yeah. so that's where you are. But when you're an adult, it's time to really start the healing and try to go in a different direction. And I definitely see that in some of my patients, it's really hard for them to let that go. Like they're in their 40s and 50s and even 60s, and they're still continuing to blame their upbringing. And I always say, you know, of course we have to recognize the trauma that happened in your upbringing, but that's not where you are now. You can make different choices Yes, now. You're an adult. And so all of that is horrible what happened to you, but if you continue to carry that with you and don't realize that at this point you're an adult and you can make different choices, it's gonna be really hard to heal. And so I, I really see my patients in these two camps. You know, One camp is like, yes, that bad stuff happened, but yes, now I'm a different person and I can try to move forward. And then there are some people who they're just so trapped by their trauma right. and they can't get past those memories. Yep. And it's really hard for them to do any kind of therapeutic work. And then talking about the issue of self-sabotage again, sometimes they self-sabotage because there's an inner part of them that doesn't believe they deserve better. So when good things start happening to them, they're like, oh, that's not the way it's supposed to go. And they kind of inadvertently blow it, you know? Um, and that's really sad to see because it's like, oh my gosh, it was just getting better. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, why, why is this happening? And so, yeah, so childhood trauma is definitely tough. But I think that the thing to remember, as you already pointed out so astutely, Jesse, is that when you're an adult, you do have the capability to change your life. Absolutely. Really you also did a, a video for the doctors, a TV show. The video was called Five LGBTQ Myth Busters mm-hmm. with Dr. Judy Ho. Is it normal to be a LGBTQ person? Is that normal? Well, again, I don't like to talk about dimensions of abnormality because it's not really about, you know, normal versus abnormal. I think it's just a different way of identification. So that's why we did that segment. It's like there's a lot of misconceptions about those segments of the population. Is there such a thing as abnormal and normal? I don't really use terms like abnormal and normal. That's a big part of, you know, the psychology um, field, trying to move away from trying to over pathologize people. Um, so it's not really about abnormality. It's like, if it's bothering you, if it's an area of distress or it's impacting your life, then let's look at it and let's try to deal with it. And that's really how the DSM, which is our diagnostic manual has moved towards. Like, how do we define somebody as having a condition? 
Condition means that the person feels really distressed or that their major areas of life are being impacted, like work, social life, relationships, and things like that. Why don't you use abnormal or normal? Uh, why don't you personally, why don't you use that? Why not observe that? Oh, because I don't think that it's a useful construct for me. I mean, obviously other people may find that those words are important to them, but it's not a useful construct for me in my professional work. So it's really important that, you know, we don't utilize it that way, but you know, I don't fault anybody who wants to talk about things in that way. Everybody is entitled to their own opinions. Even though you might not say it out loud, you do recognize normal and abnormal when you see it. You may not say it, but you do recognize it. I just don't use those constructs in my right. work. Right. So. That's what I'm saying. You may not use it out loud, but do you recognize when it's normal or abnormal? No, I don't really use those constructs. I don't think that they're useful constructs. So I don't, I mean, like, I don't remember the last time I even said the word abnormal. Really? That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. It's like not a common word in my vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> um, one last thing uh, about that is um, I saw a report the other day on, um, on one of the TV channels about a lot of these young kids are going to the experts. The boys are telling the experts they feel like girls. The girls are telling experts that they feel like a boy, right? Mm -hmm. And so what the expert does is give them medication to start changing their hormone thing, right? And they end up cutting off their body parts. And then down the road later, they realize, hey, I don't feel that way anymore. But they've been, their body parts been cut off and now they're stuck and they're committing suicide. And a lot of these people are dying by way of suicide because the experts are leading them down the wrong road. What should parents and children do when the kids think they feel like a girl or a guy when they're really a guy or a girl? What should they do? Well, I'll tell you that in our professional experiences and how we try to tell people and advise people when they feel like they have a gender identity that doesn't match their biological sex is that generally the accepted protocol is that it takes years of therapy and talking to medical doctors yeah. and talking to your family to really make sure that this is what you want. Um, and I have heard of people sometimes complaining about how long that process is, but I think it's important to have that process so that people can be thoughtful and really think through what the implications are of each of their choices. And right. it's obviously a really big decision. Um, so I don't know about as many cases where maybe that process was rushed, for example. But one thing that you did say is important to point out is that in the community of people who would identify as transgendered, suicidal rates and suicidal thoughts are higher, you know? And I think that there is a lot more distress trying to manage all of those different things and different things flying with, at you at different directions. And so, you know, I will just tell you that as part of the professional psychology community, there's usually like a whole protocol that people have to go through. It's like, are you certain? Let's meet with your counselor multiple times. Let's meet with your doctor. Let's talk about what it really means if you start taking hormones or actually going through a sex, uh, sexual gender reassignment surgery, because there's big implications either way. And I think that the process should be thoughtful and hopefully embraced by the person who's contemplating this, because it's obviously a big decision. Right. As a forensic neuropsychologist, what is the evidence that people are born gay? You know, I would not be able to speak about that because I'm not as well versed in the most recent literature about it. Oh, okay. And I know that there's always a, a debate about it, but, you know, I'm not really well versed enough to be able to talk about that. Do you know who Bruce Jenner is? Somewhat familiar. When yes. you see him in a dress, do you think this is a woman or do you, and you might not say it out loud, but, but do you know that this is a male? You know, I don't follow Bruce Jenner's career that much. I know that obviously recently Bruce has come out and identified as a transgender right. and that he identifies as female, but I don't really follow those but, types but of topical news that the media, much. Yeah. When you see him in the media on TV somewhere, do you think this is a male in a dress or does it say to you this is a woman in a dress? No, oh, I haven't seen him immediately. lately. I actually but, haven't really seen any of the, you know, different types of things that he's done where he's right. dressed like a woman. So, so you never seen Bruce that. Jenner in a dress? No, I haven't. Amazing. Yeah, I know. You know, Jesse, I actually don't follow like topical news as much. Oh, so I okay. don't actually look like I don't follow like 
I hate, like, I don't follow like the Kardashians or, you know, things like that quite as often. So I wouldn't be able to answer that question. All right. So I got to put you in the hot seat. I got to heat this up and put my guests in the hot seat. Dr. Ho, I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. All right. Okay. The hot seat. In one word, describe Joe Biden. Mm. <laughs> That's a really funny one. I, I can't even come up with something. Um, distinguished? <laughs> do, do you distinguished be- older gentleman? <laughs> Amazing. Do you believe in Jesus? I do. Capitalism or socialism? Mm. Some, not, not socialism, but like medium capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> Do you uh, do you love the great white hope? I don't know what that is. You don't know what what it is? No. Donald Trump. My mind is blanking. Donald Trump. Oh, is that oh, do I love Donald Trump? No, I don't love Donald Trump. <laughs> He's called the great white hope. You know that, right? I didn't know that. Yep. No, is that a nickname for him? Yeah, I call him the great white hope because he's such an amazing human being. I see. Yeah, yeah I, I I do I don't uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Are you in favor of psychedelics? Mm, not generally. What is a man? Mm. <laughs> there's a lot of different excellent. There's a lot of different descriptions. Mm, I don't know. Um, X Y. <laughs> 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 what is the most reliable news outlet, in your opinion? Y- yikes. This is what we're just talking about, Jesse. Right, I know. Uh, no, no, co- no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll let you know. How about TBA? TBA. All right. To be announced. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is love? Uh, acceptance. What is a woman? Mm, XX. I know I'm boring. <laughs> <laughs> Is the Illuminati controlling America? Doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> Should yeah. biological males be allowed in women's in women's sports? Wow, that's a tough question. That's not going to be a short answer. I think there's going to be all kinds of things wrapped up into that one, Jesse. Like, yeah, that'll that'll have to be tabled. You'll have to have me back for that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for taking the hot seat. Um, tell the folks how, oh, did you have fun? I did have fun, Jesse. (laughs) Thanks for all of your provocative questions. You're welcome. (laughs) Tell the folks how to, uh, get your books, your TV show and be a part of what you're doing. Tell the folks how. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Judy Ho. You can check out my website at drjudyho.com. My book, Stop Self Sabotage, is on Amazon and wherever books are sold. And I also have a podcast called Supercharged Life with Dr. Judy, so check that out. Amazing. Dr. Judy Ho, thank you so much for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it. Thank you very much, Jesse. Have a great one. All right, you too. And thank you, folks, for uh, uh, being a part of this today. Let me hear from you. Don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, share, ring the bell, check out our merch, amazing merch in the, in the store there. And also click on the Patreon link in the description to support our work. Let me hear from you folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next time on The Fallen State. Did the Chinese virus occur naturally or was it made in a lab? Made in a lab. What the? What the? (laughs) Where in LA did you grow up? Some people call it South Central Los Angeles, Crenshaw District. Right on. People made fun of my name. Your parents were drunk when they named me (laughs) Cut, Cut, Cut Beer or Nigerian Booty Scratcher. What made you contact me? I just felt like, man, this guy sounds like you know the Bible. And a lot of these Christian pastors show how they're hypocritical. Did you grow up knowing that you wanted to be a football player? I just wanted to grow up and be a plumber. As an Israelite, you believe that a man can have more than one wife? Absolutely. I'm trying to have 94 children. Whoa! I have a woman, and when she doesn't obey me, it could cause me to be angry or upset. But you're supposed to correct your wife, but not with anger, with perfect love.
Thanks for watching The Fallen State. We need your continued support. Donate to my nonprofit here. Subscribe and like the videos here. And tell everybody and their mama about the show. Thank you.